Good morning. The, uh, the music today, actually one of my favorite dance pieces, is called Farewell to Whiskey, and it's from the 1880s. It's a piece of con contra dance music. Since we're going to be talking a little more about labor today, I thought we'd get something a little more robust. Last time I gave you something from uh, Mark Twain's America CD, and it, it was a waltz medley that you probably would have recognized, The Flying Trapeze, Bicycle Built for Two, and After the Ball, all from the, 18, from the 1890s. Or, needless to say, moving back and forth across that period. This is fragment three from game three, the East Village. And it's a bust at the top of a building, as you can see, of five physicians. Some of you will have probably seen this if you've been looking up enough at, built, at buildings now and finding this. So again, you want to identify who, those, who, them, who them folks are, the origins of the building and its contemporary use. Okay? It relates, of course, very much to the kinds of things that we've been talking about, we'll be talking about. The final exam, we have some clarity. I did my very best to muck things up last time. It is Monday, the 10th of May at 10 a.m. in this space. At 10 a.m. in this space, an hour and 50 minutes. So Monday, the 10th, the graduation at Yankee Stadium is on the 12th, and I think the baccalaureate is on the 11th, so it's the 10th. Should be a rel relatively free morning. Um, those of you who are seniors and anxious about graduating, graduating um, not to worry, the, the, the registrar is more than familiar with this. They, they have accommodations for making sure you graduate and the, the grades get delivered um, after you've graduated with the assumption that you're all going to pass. And uh, I see no reason why that shouldn't be the case. And it never has been. So if, if you're having moments of anxiety, come in. I'll make you a cup of coffee. you relax and chill. It'll be okay. Everything will be fine. Okay? The exams will be coming back um, shortly or in sections. Again, as I said, I think they were generally fine. There was a little conf uh, discrepancy among the uh, discussion leaders about how to grade the short answer, and I've tried, we've, we've met and talked about that informally. In some cases, it's straightforward. In other cases, I've just suggested they be curved so that they reflect the stronger performance on the essays so that there's no downside on the, on the short answers. So some people were just, some of the, some of the discussion leaders um, were more generous when the answers were not quite right and some were less generous, but we've adjusted it in order to, in order to balance them out across the sections by simply um, adding points so that the, to, to where they're lower so that they average out the same as in the, high, in, in the other sections and that they turn out to be no lower than the grades on the essays, which tended to be quite strong. So the grades have been, as I've suggested to you before, um, pretty high from what I can see. I don't think. But if you have questions, by all means, feel free to come in and chat with me about them or chat with your discussion leader, but I, I suspect you won't have any problems. Okay? Any questions about any of that kind of procedural stuff? As you know, we took attendance last uh, week, uh, last uh, Monday, and we will again a few more times during the course of the semester. So just, you know, but we'll do it the same way, just passing a, a list around just to keep you honest, as it were. Okay? Uh, one last thing again is I will conduct a walking tour on, sa on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. It will be the Chelsea tour. It is completely voluntary. This is, uh, there's, you don't get points on or off for doing this. Um, I, I just do this as a favor to those classmates who are interested in learning more about the city. This tour begins, I think it's in the syllabus listed on 8th Avenue and 23rd Street on the north and west corner. It's the, it's the downtown side, effectively, if you were coming on the, on the train, but you can get off. It exits to both sides. So just walk to that northwest corner, and we'll leave around 10 o'clock by walking on 24th Street toward the west, toward 10th Avenue, then circling back all the way to 6th Avenue, and we'll end up near the High Line uh, around the just a little above the meat part, the, the, the old, what was once the meatpacking district, but the new Chelsea Art Gallery seen in the High Line area around uh, 9th Avenue and uh, 15th Street around noon. Okay? You'll, 
As I mentioned also to you last time, while the syllabus says that you're going to be talking about the bourgeoisie, that's going to be a lecture on Monday, and you'll hear a little bit why I've put them a little out of sequence. If I were uh, being, I've taught this course in different ways from year to year a little bit, and I probably would have been happier if next Monday's lecture were last Monday's lecture. They're interchangeable, but you'll hear why I've organized them in terms of this lecture today. Uh, and it's because of uh, an anniversary that corresponds with this lecture. Working men enlisted in the Civil War in large numbers. That meant in New York City, a substantial number of those people were the Irish immigrant working class identifying with their new country and in the effort to preserve the Union. These would be people from the same background who three years later, from a community that would find itself, as you know, in the draft riot, suddenly in opposition to what they saw as the turn in social policy or political policy around the war. But at the outbreak of the war, they enlist in large and disproportionate numbers in the war effort. And they return after the war, not unlike in other war experiences from veterans, expecting jobs, expecting that they now would be treated as Americans who had fought for America and with the rights of Americans that would be protected by the state. Indeed, it's worth noting if one wants to talk about the origins of the American welfare state, and it's perhaps it's interesting to do so on the dawn of a morning after this legislation that passed yesterday, the origins of welfare state legislation in the United States and, and, and benefiting cities like New York disproportionately, where a large part of the urban poor lived, came out of the Civil War and it was veterans benefits. Those were the kind of benefits that were set up by the welfare state. So there was a notion that the state understood that it had a real obligation to people who had been, who had laid down their lives or put their lives at risk on behalf of the country. And the apparatus of welfare home, I'm sorry, of veterans homes, veterans hospitals are established after the war as the first real major effort at providing a kind of federally sponsored welfare program. There had been small scale but meaningful state programs if you think of um, things like the building of the, the aqueduct or Central Park as programs that provided jobs provided by the state. But this was a kind of welfare program. So in addition, coming back after the war, the economy suddenly starts to boom because in fact industrial production, which had been either stalled by the war effort or transformed into wartime production, now is re-energized around domestic production. And so there are jobs available. And that's the context when there are more jobs, when labor suddenly has more power because people want to hire them. Rather than being in surplus, labor is now in demand. And that gives them new power for organizing behind their rights. And labor, for the first time in the United States, begins to organize its own national labor movement. The major union was called the National Labor Union, not surprisingly, the NLU. In New York, one of the organizations that pressed for rights came out of those ethnic communities, and it was the Germans Working Men's Association. It had origins even before the war, when the Germans had come here, remember, after 1848, and they had formed a, a rich political associational life, not unlike the political traditions in which they had been engaged in Germany, and they form a working men's association that now fights for a eight-hour movement. Do you remember that in New York City in the 1830s, people had been fighting for a 10-hour movement. Now we suddenly have them fighting for an eight-hour movement. And the National Labor Union will be the national vehicle struggling for this thing called eight hours. A really pretty extraordinary advance, at least in the kinds of notions of demands of rights that labor is coming to have. They are joined by a coalition of workers in building this worker movement that was going to be informed by the socialism that these Germans had experienced in Germany in the revolutions of 1848. 
The Communist Club of New York had been formed in 1857 by a man named of Frederick Sorg, S-O-R-G, and it had affiliated with the International Working Men's Association, the IWA, the interna an international, not just New York-based, that had been founded by this man named Karl Marx, in London, who had been in London in 1864. Marx, some of you may know, had in fact written several articles on the Civil War for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. So he was not unknown to New Yorkers. He was the author of commentaries on the Civil War that had appeared in the New York press. So he was known both to Americans and especially to these German socialists. The IWA, this Working Men's Association, joins with a group of people who are known as the Lasallians, after a man named Ferdinand Lasalle, L-A-S-S-A-L-E. Lasalle, just add A-N-S, the Lasallians, Ferdinand Lasalle. And they are particularly committed to cooperativism, to creating worker cooperatives at this moment. And that will also, by the way, be very important in the development of the National Labor Union. It will become a movement that is committed not just to class conflict and fighting, but actually workers as an alternative form of organization creating cooperatives. You, some of you will know of things that are called um, consumer cooperatives, like the Brooklyn Co-op. Any of you know about the Brooklyn Co-op? Anybody here? Yeah, raise a hand, two, okay. And what is the Brooklyn Co-op? Um, yeah, you're on. Oh, it's um, a grocery store. Yeah, basically it's a large, it's a bigger than a grocery store, more, more like what we, we would call a supermarket, only it's collectively owned by the people who are expected then to put in some time each month working there. The produce, they create their own management staff, and supposedly they limit the profits which are turned back into the price, <coughs> into the price structure of the goods. Okay? So it's a cooperative that they create. What's different here is that these people are beginning to think about creating not consumer cooperatives, but producer cooperatives. They're going to join together to create their own factories, to create their own mills, to be making the goods themselves, not just selling the goods. So to people who are outside of this cooperative system, but in the the burgeoning young capitalists, this was a threat. This was competition, but not of the kind of competition that they wanted because it was competition that was not committed to the profit system. It was committed to a not-profit system. And so that really threatened the kind of principles under which the for-profit system was organized. So this was, in its own way, revolutionary, though the revolutionary doesn't mean violent, as you see. It was it was a revolutionary in its principles about the organization of production, not just consumption. Okay? So that's what the Lasallians are organized. They are joined by a group of radical women, in particular Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, leaders of the radical women's rights movement, which you will remember has its origins back to the 1840s in support of African-American rights, abolitionism, but you'll remember that the Women's Rights Convention was held in 1846 in Seneca Falls, New York, which all of you will remember is located between Rochester and Syracuse on that path that the Erie Canal cut, that whole area that was called the Burnt Out District, that area that reflected the transformation from a, a term you all know now extremely well, the moral economy, to a market economy. And, and that transformation was very disruptive and upset a lot of people and they organized around it in terms of different forms of rights. And women's rights was one of those forms of organizations and it comes all the way back to New York City, all the way up through those kinds of areas. These people, leading by Anthony, student Anthony and, and Stanton, form the Working Women's Association in 1868. So there are women who are organizing around women's rights and understanding or arguing that women's rights are tied to issues around production and have a class component. 
and have a class component. It's mostly made up of female typographers because that was one of the few trades in which women got occupations, had, had jobs, and it was a very highly skilled trade. So they tended to be people who had enough income to be able to advance themselves and also be able to weather a strike. One of the ironies about people that often were prepared to be most militant in labor conflicts is that they often weren't the poorest people who were often the most exploited or felt could have, one could have ex ex expected might have felt most exploited, but the people, but they were, the, the poorest were often the most vulnerable and they had the fewest resources. You went out on strike, you, had, you didn't have anything to fall back on. Typographers did in the sense that they were reasonably well paid and because they had a skill, they were in demand. They weren't easily replaced. So it made them a more class conscious group of workers with some ability to defend themselves. Okay? So it's not coincidental that they might have been the folks who would have organized in this kind of trade. They also went out because in fact the male typographers union wouldn't allow them into their own union. So there was a logic that part of the reason why women were organizing was because patriarchy, chauvinism within the trade union movement among men was not acknowledging that women had problems that needed to be defended as well. Men more often as not were prepared to argue women belonged at home raising our babies. So there was a logic here for these women to form their own organization too. So they're joining now with the Lasallians and with yet a third group of people that come in and those are the ethnic radicals. The most particular of whom, groups we've also talked about, some of the Irish radicals. We've talked about some of the faction fighting among the Irish and we saw it in the video that we saw earlier this semester. Well, the Irish were organized around nationalist demands that were anti-colonialist. The colonialism that they saw as their enemy had been English landlords. So it wasn't simply that the English were an enemy country that they saw as occupying their land, but as landlords, they were an enemy elite that was also occupying their land. So there was a, again, a kind of social or class dimension to their nationalism as it was early articulated within some of the groups. That class element sometimes is strong and sometimes gets wiped out entirely and it becomes just ethnicity and not about class. But at this moment, some of these organizations, the Irish on the whole, were not terribly wealthy. The Irish on the whole were struggling for jobs. They still were facing a society that was telling them no Irish need apply. So they understood discrimination. They organized most particularly in groups like the Fenians, F-E-N-I-A-N, the Fenians, which were the most militant of these Irish groups. Among the most militant, there was even a more militant group that was highly secretive called the Clan the Gael, but we'll stick with the Fenians. The Fenians were the broadest based and the widest, and they join in the National Labor Union's command, demand for eight hours. So the National Labor Union brings together all of these groups, these disparate kinds of groups. Working men who had fought in the war, German socialists, women radicals in trade unions, Fenians who are radical and have a kind of class understanding of, their, of the ways in which they've been diminished in New York society, and they all come together in this group called the National Labor Union. They fight for eight hours. They are way ahead of their time in the things they're fighting for. These are things that are not going to be won for generations. They fight for eight hours. They fight for, it's quite extraordinary at the time, though to you it may all seem quite commonplace, a progressive income tax. They fight for equal rights for men and women. Though, as you've heard, the, the men weren't always quite as enthusiastic about that as the women were. And they fight, and their tool for this often was consumer cooperatives. Consumer cooperatives. For those of you who have some passing interest and come out of Tisch and film interest, 
my first book dealt with some, one of my, my original PhD thesis and first book dealt with some of this in an upstate town, uh, a town called Troy, New York. And the city book is called Worker City Company Town. But I made a film for public television, which is available um, in uh, Avery Fisher, which dramatizes the story of from the 1850s through the 1870s and ends with the struggle over building a cooperative for these worker and their families to try to gain a foothold um, in the new society. Um, it was done as a kind of pilot for American television. Uh, it's trying to do what the British had done in their series, their dramatic series on PBS. Um, we were not successful, but the film is of passing interest and it's, it's called The Molders of Troy for those of you who just want to have a uh, an, an hour and a half of fun watching a video, we'll get a sense of the ways in which those stories played out. It's a, it's a dramatic, a, it's a fictional count and completely true. What I mean by that is that the, the names, the people are, made, are mostly made up, some are true, but it tries to be true to the history of the times and the social relations that animated those struggles. And it's around labor and it ends with this struggle over with a worker cooperative. And it ends with violence and a way of looking at violence in Troy around what were called law and order leagues in the 1870s. And it will give you, again, a way of thinking about the problem that I've suggested in some of your essays and exam questions about how one understands violence from the multiple perspectives, the perspectives of the police, the perspective of stove makers, and the perspectives of the Irish working class who were themselves divided between those Irishmen who think of themselves as working class and those Irish who are more mobile and wanting to think of themselves now as just as Irish, around an Irish identity rather than a class identity. Can you just say hand? Yes. Hi, uh, did, was it consumer cooperatives or production cooperatives? Good question. It was a production cooperative. They built their own stove foundry. And it becomes the, it is the uh, ultimate fight that is ultimately waged nationwide by the National Labor Union. It's fought up there over a stove, over a stove cooperative that so they built. The National Labor Union was fighting for production cooperatives? It was fighting for, it was fighting for, it was using as its weapon produce, the creation of producer cooperatives to win their strikes. They're saying, you're putting us out of work, we'll defeat you by building our own factory and not take your jobs. That's what they tried to do. And they do that successfully until the 1870s, between 73 and 77, they collapse. Anyone have any idea why they might have collapsed during those years? I'll tell you a little bit about those years. What, what happens in years between threes and sevens? Depression. Depression. The first real industrial depression in the United States is 1873 to 77, lasts four years. And these producer cooperatives don't have banks at their back. They don't have the capital to compete or survive and keep their people employed. So they collapsed during that depression. Anyway, all of that's in that film if you want to have some fun playing with all of that. An early piece of, a long, an early piece of my past. Indeed, the 1873 depression crushes workers and their families, generally. And as I just said, it's the first major industrial depression. It lasts four years. Many lose their jobs. What's striking about that period, unlike today, is when they lost jobs, they were often asked, or, or were working, they were asked to take wage cuts of 33 to 50%. So they often kept their jobs, but were asked to take enormous wage cuts. The cooperatives withered, as I suggest, they didn't have money. So what are the origins of the Depression? Well, we know something about it, overproduction. Railroad growth had expanded quickly, bond defaults. American industry, um, had its notions about a free market, and it was that you don't try to control levels of production. You don't tell different employers how much they can produce. Employers said, don't tell us what we can do. And so they just produced as much as they could, and they, glut, they created a glut in the market and created this kind of depression. The workers, however, have to organize because they're all out of work. The Working Men's Central Council in New York City, mostly German socialists, but including as its leader a man by the name of J.P. MacDonald, who is both a Fenian and a socialist, calls for a mass meeting at the Cooper Union around the corner. This whole area becomes very important. It takes place December 11th, 1873, and here just after the strike. So this national movement really, it's based 
often in, in, in a city like New York, where there you have the largest organized working class, it's already by far the largest city in the United States. 10,000 people fill the hall and outside it, all demanding jobs from the city. The city had created its, quote, Council of 50 to consider what should be done in the Depression to help people. But the Council of 50, as you might expect, did not include anyone from the working class. It was made up simply of manufacturers and elites. The Cooper, at Cooper Union, these people create, you know, I, I'm reading my notes backwards. Um, Erase the last, five, the last 30 seconds of what I've said. The, at Cooper Union, this the, the workers organize their own council of 50. Quite a difference. It is a worker council of 50. It is not a manufacturer's council to which they're appealing. The council of 50 excites the opposition of elites in the city because the term reflects a term that had become quite popular out of protest in Paris two years earlier by the communards, the Paris Commune of 1871. And the Paris Commune, in news of it, which had sped through New York newspapers, had all excited fears of this new thing called communism, which seemed to have now taken over and exerted enormous power in Paris and the fear now was that these working men at Cooper Union were going to be creating a comparable institutional base in New York City. New York City, that's to say, and it becomes part of our particular New York legacy, was going to become the center of American radicalism at the same time as it was going to become the center of Wall Street, an American capital. Both are now existing, and one is downtown and one is only slightly uptown. Today we call from Cooper Union would be downtown as well. So in Cooper Union we've got the workers organizing and in Wall Street two miles below we have capital represented. And in New York City we have the center of both. An extraordinary thing. The responses from capital as a consequence from 1871 on are marked by what increasingly historians would argue the origins of American anti-communism really go back to the 18, early 1870s in New York City. All grievances that would be expressed by these people in the elite press are now seen as grievances of outside agitators, Germans, German socialists, un people who are articulating and expressing un-American positions. And remember, the American position, some of which I'll review again for you yes, next time, were the positions that were articulated around the gospel of wealth, positions around um, social Darwinism. Again, I'll try to elaborate some of that for you again next time. So they're now arguing that anything, the elites are now seeing anything articulated by the working class as anti-communist positions articulated by un as un-American, outside agitators. The mayor at the time, a man by the name of Havermeyer, have as like has ever have like like and to have and to hold, have a Meyer, was in fact elected as the, and again the word is instructive here for you to think about, as the reform mayor. He was being a reform mayor because he was he had won by defeating Tammany Hall, okay, which was the Democratic by arguing that was a boss machine. And there's lots of evidence that it was. But Havermeyer's reform was characterized by his, beha by his behavior. He just, to reform meant, in fact, now to represent the interests of capital entirely. He dismisses all the grievances that are articulated at Cooper Union as the complaints of people who have not, as he put, saved for a rainy day and who have gone and wasted all their money on beer and the theaters. Beer being a reference to the Germans, needless to say. The workers hold a rally the next month on January 13th of 1874 at Tompkins Square. Again, another reference I've given you in an exam question, uh, not exam, as possible essay question to think about. 
So again, this area that becomes identified and associated with political protest. There are three such major sites all in this area, if you think about them, right? Union Square, Washington Square Park, Tompkins Square Park. So there become these kind of social spaces that come to be defended and articulated as spaces where radicals and working class people and bohemians, people who are seen as not quite fitting in with the rest of society are here trying to articulate alternative notions about society. And that's what now the effort at Tompkins Square is. 7,000 people attend. And it is meant to be a protest rally to articulate and support the demands for bread and wages and jobs that had been so roundly dismissed by Havermeyer. Havermeyer's response is to send in the police to break up the crowd with clubs. The accounts in the press, reinforced by the mayor and by even the police chief who serves, did their bidding, was to applaud the, ta the attack as on people who were, quote, the rabble, who were preparing for insurrection. That's to say, it was to argue that these were simply, again, outside agitators that were interested in nothing but armed insurrection against American principles. The aftermath of this as a consequence is that by the 1870s, there is an increasingly wide gap now being widely perceived between the interests of labor and the interests of the group I will talk about more concretely next time of this bourgeoisie, of these new wealthy rising capitalists who are part of the creation of this new burgeoning city. They'll be behind the creation, the walking tour we'll see, of the Ladies' Mile, of these new department stores that are not only sites for large capitalists, in this case department store owners, to create wealth, but they're also sites for consumption to create a new kind of affluent standard of living for the emergence of this new upper middle, uh, the emergence of something that could be called a middle class, a new kind of class that identifies itself as consumers and by its standard of living and that has access, additional income. So they tend to be people who are not necessarily part of the working class that are going to be shopping in these, in these places. But that's a, a more complicated history we'll come into. The point is, there's a greater sense by the 70s of a gap now between labor and the ways in which the city is responding to it. The state is mobilized by capital for the first time much more actively. It had been as early as you may recall in 1834 when the National Guard is called out. What happens after the 1870s, however, the state had been now heavily, the federal state heavily mobilized in the South during Reconstruction. So the troops had been sent disproportionately really to deal with what it saw as the major effort of preserving the Union and ending the conditions of slavery that had existed in the South. Reconstruction is brought to a rather quick end in 1876, and all those troops are now brought back to the North where they would be mobilized for the first time in the first national strike in the United States in 1877. It was the railroad strike. And it followed, again, wage reductions by the very wealthiest corporations in the United States. The railroads were, had become the symbol for American wealth and power. Just in the sense of the great, I mean, it was a metaphor, even in the, the, the idea of the engine, the steam engine, the image of the steam engine, carving up the West, moving from East to West, became an image of the United States moving from East to West, taking over land and having this enormous uh, machine that it had created that, pro that provided this kind of mobility. So it becomes a kind of image for American success. And the corporate leaders who lead this are easily seen as these new captains of industry. From labor's perspective, they will be given a very different kind of term. They will not be seen simply of captains of industry. They will be seen as robber barons.
and both images compete with the understanding of who these new leaders would be. The railroad strike is seen by, however, by the press, which is in the hands on the whole of elites, as led, and I quote the New York Times, by, as communistic and law-defying. On July 15, 1877, again, back in New York City, tw Union, Union Square, 20,000 New Yorkers rally in support, led by the German Working Men's Party. The police had been called back to duty. Now two regiments of the National Guard are called out. And as the rally is ending, two hours after it, the police again attacked it, attack it, according to all accounts, without any provocation. The aftermath, however, is that the US War Department begins to build the network of urban armories that had already, New York City had already begun to build. So you'll remember, we talked about Joel Tyler Headley's book coming out in 1876, calling for New York armories, that the great railroad strike of 1877 convinces federal politicians that in fact what was needed in New York was needed nationwide. And the whole armory, the American armory system comes out really after this national railroad strike as a recognition that the state has to be involved in domestic control. Okay, to, to, uh, in administering domestic law and order. And law and order has to be understood as being a kind of meta-commentary on this urban protest around, uh, initiated by workers for wages during a depression. In the 1880s, the new urban immigrant labor force has to organize and tries to organize to deal with these new labor conditions. But work had fundamentally changed. Capital had fundamentally changed. And one needs to have some sense of how that complicated what it wanted to do. What did it mean to be a worker in New York City? How had work changed in New York if they were to organize? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that work was not, work places and capital was now increasingly dominated by new forms of something that was called monopoly. In truth, it was more oligarchy than monopoly. It wasn't usually one company controlling everything. It was usually one or two companies controlling everything. But for the first time, we have the creation of large-scale monopolies. The basic monopoly, the first major well-known monopoly was Standard Oil. And later, you know, you know, for instance, it would become AT&T. And those monopolies would only be in the 20th century by the state would be, would be broken up during the progressive era. And we would end up having a whole series of oil companies out of, out of what was Exxon, what became, what was, used to be called ESSO. E-S-S-O is still in, still in Canada, it's called ESSO. So you had the monopoly company. Who, who was the wealthy owner of that company? Okay, so that was Rockefeller. And most of these large monopolies are associated with one major person. Why did they organize this way? Well, it was a way, frankly, of cutting costs and limiting competition. It involved increasingly both vertical and horizontal integration in these monopolies. And that will affect how workers can organize and the power they will have. What's the difference between a vertical and horizontal organization? A horizontal organization is where a company tries to buy out all its competing companies. Okay? And increasingly during this period, that's what happens. In most cities where there might have been many textile mills or many garment mills or small factories, they buy out the smaller ones. That tendency, by the way, persists today. Think of the number of newspapers in, in most American cities. Or think of, of the number of companies that own both newspapers and television stations and internet stations, and et cetera. Murdoch is an example of that kind of thing, right? So that's vertical, that's horizontal. What is vertical integration? Well, that's where you decide that you're going to buy as many companies that are involved in the different stages from 
where raw materials are made to where distribution is done. So if you're involved, for instance, in textiles, you buy a, plant you buy a plantation. Perhaps you buy ships that bring the cotton over so you don't have to pay extra for the cotton. You buy the plantation and then you don't have to, you can absorb the profit from the plantation when you bring the cotton north to the textile mill. You buy the textile mill and maybe you buy a bank so that the bank can provide money for your textile mill without profits. You buy railroads to carry the stuff back and forth. You then decide you're going to buy clothing stores and you're then going to buy st retail stores, department stores. You try to buy as many stages as you can in that process. Then if you're involved in a struggle against a competitor, who is, say, a competitor just in a department store, you can decide to shift all of your costs or prop to the other side and lower your costs just in competing with that department store because you can decide you'll take losses at the department store because you'll be making the profits at the other stage until you can push your competitor out of business in the department store. So there was enormous power in trying to gain this kind of vertical integration. And increasingly, that's what comes to characterize industry, including industries in New York City. So increasingly, the banks, the insurance companies, are involved in these vertical and horizontal mega corporations power. And so workers are going out on strike in one given city, but they're dealing with a corporation that can afford to shut down and make its profit in three other cities or four other stages of production. So it means for a worker to have to be successful, they would theoretically have to organize the workers in every other part of that corporation at every other stage in development. An enormously complicated problem. And imagine what that will be like when the corporations become international and decide, hell, you go on a strike here, we'll just ship all our, we'll shift all of our production to Singapore. Try organizing those workers or to a back office in India. So in fact, the whole creation of, that, of what we now know around modern industry and work has many of its origins in the reorganization of work taking place in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s and accelerating, and it's transforming the workplace in New York City. However, the transformation that's most dramatic is what we would call Taylorism. It's actually what's happening at the point of production itself. It's named after a man named Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's not a New Yorker, though he spends time in New York like everybody else. He is the father of scientific management. He's actually the father of what later become all the business schools in the United States. The idea is you can make a science out of how to make profits and how to uh, get, more, get more, uh, more blood out of a stone. In this case, how you can get more work out of a worker. And you'll see the case study. His famous study was over someone he called, in, in this Principles of Scientific Management, over someone he called Schmidt the Pig Iron Handler. And let me tell you a little bit about Schmidt. This was the little study that he did. He was called in to uh, Midvale to a steel plant, an iron ore plant in Pennsylvania. And he was said, our pro their problem, they said, was how to increase production and how to get production more efficient. That they had workers and they just weren't able to get the workers to do more work. So he decides to make a science of how to study these workers. His first step, he says, is the scientific selection of the workmen. So he looks around and finds men, he agrees, who appear to be physically able to do the work. Now the work involved was carrying cartons of steel, okay, pig iron, actually ore, okay, pig ore, pig iron, and they had to carry this pig iron from point A to point B, and then go back and get get it again and carry it to point B. The question was. He said, well, let's find somebody who's strong enough who can do that. Well, this looks like the kind of guy who can do it, so we'll find somebody who's beefy who can do it. Looks like they can handle it. We find out, well, let's measure how long it takes to go from there to there. Well, it takes, what, about three seconds, you figure? 
and maybe two seconds to walk back, that's five seconds. How many trips should you be able to make in a minute? Gee, if the whole thing takes five seconds, 12 trips. So we want to get somebody who's strong enough to do it. Well, what did he actually do usually if he was like me? He went to the, you checked your heartbeat, and, you, and maybe you had a drink of beer, and he went back. Because if I finished doing that, by the way, quickly, and I finished it, what was going to happen? The job was done. I was out of work. So first of all, it was physically exhausting. Second of all, there was a logic to make the job last. But it wasn't Taylor's logic. It was your logic. So the problem was how to make you understand that your logic needs to be Taylor's logic. That's the challenge of scientific management, how to get you to think like Taylor, and more importantly, be happy doing so. That was crucial. So he tries to find somebody who can move iron at the rate of 47 tons as opposed to the rate of 12 and a half tons. They were moving 12 and a half tons a day. We've got to get somebody who can move 47 tons a day. So a careful study was made. We looked up their history as far back as practical. I'm reading from Taylor. And th thorough inquiries were made as to the character, habits, and ambition of each man. Finally, we selected one from the four as the most likely man to start with. He was a little Pennsylvania Dutchman who had been observed to trot back home for a mile or so after his work in the evening, about as fresh as he was when he came trotting down to work in the morning. And we found out that upon a wage of $1.15 a day, he had succeeded in saving a small plot of land, and he was engaged in uh, putting up walls of a little house for himself in the morning before starting to work and at night after leaving. He also had the, uh, he had the reputation of being close. That's another word for meaning cheap, tight with his money, or thrifty would be the word we would use, the positive word. That is, of placing a very high value on a dollar. As the one man whom we talked to about him said, a penny looks about the size of a cartwheel to him. So this man we'll call Schmidt. So he, we've identified Schmidt. He's this thrifty, hardworking Dutchman who we know is full of energy, full of piss and vinegar. He gets up in the morning. He starts working on his house. He runs to work. He does his work. He goes home, and he continues to work and builds his house. He knows the value of a dollar, and he's got unbridled energy. He's the ideal character for the person we want. So I come in and we talk to Schmidt. So the task before us, says Taylor, is of getting Schmidt here to handle 47 tons of pig iron a day and making him glad to do it. This was done as follows. We called him out from among a group of pig iron handlers and talked to him somewhat in this way. Uh, Schmidt. Are you a high-priced man? Well, I don't know what you mean. Oh, come on. Yes, you do. What I want to know is whether you're a high-priced man or not. Well, I don't know what you mean. Oh, come on now. You answer my question. What I want to find out is whether you're a high-priced man or, or whether you're one of these cheap fellas here. I want to find out whether you want to earn $1.85 a day or whether you're satisfied making just $1.15 a day, just the same as all these cheap fellas here are getting. Did I want $1.85 a day? Was that a high-priced man? Well, yes, I was a high-priced man. Oh, you're aggravating me, Schmidt. Of course you want $1.85 a day. Every man wants it. You know perfectly well that it has very little to do with your being a high-priced man. For goodness sake, now, answer my questions and don't waste any more of my time. Now, come over here. Now, you see that pile of pig iron? Yes. And you see that car over there? Yes. Well, if you're a high-priced man, you'll load that pig iron onto that car tomorrow for $1.85. Now, do wake up and answer my question. Tell me now whether you're a high-priced man. Well, well <laughs> do I get $1.85 for, for loading that pig iron on that car tomorrow? Yes, of course you do. And you get $1.85 for loading a pile like that every day right through the year. That's what a high-priced man does, and you know it just as well as I do. Well, that, that's all right. I could load that pig iron tomorrow for $1.85, ah, and I get it every day, don't I? Certainly you do. Certainly you do. Well, then, I was a high-priced man. Now, 
Okay, now hold on. You know just as well as I that a high-priced man has to do exactly as he's told from morning till night. Now, you've, 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 you've seen this man here before? Behind you, yeah? No, I never saw him. Well, <laughs> if you're a high-priced man, you'll do exactly as this man tells you tomorrow. He's a man who has a little stopwatch. Okay. You'll do exactly as he tells you tomorrow from morning till night. When he tells you to pick up the pig iron and walk, you pick it up and you walk. And when he tells you to put it down, you put it down. And you do that right through, through the day. Right? So you can know what was going to happen. Yeah. You got it, right? And more importantly, what's more? No back talk. Right? A high-priced man just does what he's told to do. And no back talk. Do you understand that? When this man tells you to walk, you walk. When he tells you to sit down, we're not going to have him sit down. You sit down. You don't talk back at him. So you come back here tomorrow morning, and you'll know before night whether you're really a high-priced man or not. Okay, now, Taylor's talking to the rest of us now. He says, you know this seems to be rather tough talk, right? And indeed, it would be if applied to an educated mechanic or even to an intelligent laborer. But with a man of the sluggish type of Schmidt, it's appropriate and not unkind since it's effective in actually fixing his attention on the high wages which he wants and what, from what, if it were called to his attention, he would probably consider otherwise impossibly hard work. So that was the key. It was to offer him a little more money, convince him, but it presumed that what were workers like. They were workers were dull, they were stupid, they were sluggish, they had to be taught how to think right and had to be taught to do exactly as they're told or they would be fired. And he'd be offered $1.85. And they would ultimately fight. Now, if, they, if he could move all that to $1.85, what, you would be working alongside him. We can fire you. We don't need you anymore because before we were only moving 17 and a half. Now we're moving 47 tons so we can get rid of two other people because we've moved that much. So maybe we'll only get rid of one because we, unless you're willing to do the work as well. But ultimately, we either can overproduce or we can get rid of half of our labor force. The other thing is you will not surprise you to learn is that the additional wage that was offered quickly um, caught up with the cost of living and wasn't increased. So they end up making the same wage later as they made before. And they did this. So the key, however, is that what they create in American labor force, and this becomes a model for the garment industry, the textile industry, the shoe industry, and every other form of industry is to measure the output in piece, work, in, the, in piece rates. Work was divided into small pieces which would be timed in terms of how long you were going to work it. And workers always got panicked whenever they saw someone work into, walk into the workshop with a watch in their hand because they knew that was what was happening. It was going to now be scientifically measured as to how much they could do. So that's how work was being transformed during this period. The problem was, for American workplaces, for manufacturers, that not all workers were, of the, were, quote, sluggish. Not all were as dumb as Taylor and the manufacturers, in fact, often presumed. Some, in fact, saw their worth, and some also saw their work was, in fact, getting harder, and that they were ultimately not being paid anymore. And they went out in protest. The protest was led by radicals and then quickly picked up by the American labor movement. Jonathan Most, M-O-S-T, arrives in Brooklyn in 1881, for instance. He was an anarchist. He'd been arrested in London, released, comes to, goes to Chicago, where he organizes an anarchist group. Their numbers were small, but the fear of them was great. They believed that the state had, in fact, had been taken over entirely by capital, was a servant of capital, and the state had no useful role to play in people's lives. On May 1st, 1886, the American working class organizes a protest for shorter hours, for an eight-hour day. It's organized all around the country, including Union Square. In Chicago, it takes place on May 1st, 1886, and a bomb is thrown near the end of the rally. 
To this day, the source of the bomb was not known. The events afterwards are known, and it was known as, became known as the Haymarket Massacre. Nine men were arrested, but they were men, most of whom were not even at the riot. And they were tried and convicted of having been the bomb throwers, though we, this much we know they weren't there. They become a cause celebre for the organization of an American labor movement. The New York City Central Labor Union calls a rally of the working class in support of the Haymarket Martyrs in July of 1886. And a rally forms in which the Amer New York workers try to form their own political party. That was one socialist strategy, by the way, always. There were socialists divided among strategies. One was to try to organize at the point of production, to take over production. The other was to organize politically, to organize an alternative political party, a socialist party. And that was the wing here that was gaining ascendance, at least at this particular moment. They create the United Labor Party, and they choose as their candidate for mayor a man by the name of Henry George. One of your, the question, one, again, one of the topics I've given you is to think about Henry George. Henry George is a very famous American because of a book he writes called Progress and Poverty, in which he articulates and understands by surveying America that American progress is coincident with the rise of poverty, that it is in fact dependent, he argues, on American poverty that the rich are getting rich by controlling limited resources in America and impoverishing Americans. And the limited resource that was most being monopolized, he argued, was land. And therefore, his call was, radical call was for a <coughs> single tax, one tax only, and it would be on land, property tax. You could imagine there were some people who were not thrilled with that idea, property holders. But that was his radical proposition. It won, by the way, enormous support, in particular within the Irish community, that formed land and labor leagues. And why would they have particularly, do you think, rallied in support of this plan? Because they saw it as the basis of English tyranny over Ireland, English land lords. Excuse me, so Henry George becomes especially symbolic as a hero and a strategist for the Irish working class in the United States and more broadly to socialists and to the trade union movement. His single tax land stimulates, as I say, these working labor leaders and gains the support of Irish nationalists, pro labor Catholics, labor radicals. It also gains the enmity, however, of course, of property interests, including, by the way, the leadership of the Catholic hierarchy, led by Archbishop Michael Corrigan in New York City, who was one of the very wealthiest Catholics in the city. That's to say it's important to understand that the Irish are not all unified, they're not all poor, that the division that takes place often has a kind of class dimension in all of this as well, as an ethnic dimension, as well as a religious dimension. So most of the Irish are poor and are Catholic and are aligned in the Land and Labor Leagues, but there increasingly now is an affluent Catholic cadre or group that had gained a foothold. They were sometimes policemen now, new professionals. They were in the mayor's office. They are themselves gaining positions in industry. And they are the hierarchy within the church that was often quite powerful. And they are often virently anti-labor, okay? And often virently anti-labor as well. The wealthy New Yorkers run in opposition to Henry George, a man who had made his name in the City Affairs Committee as a friend of the rich, by opposing any increases in labor and costs for municipal labor workers, meaning police and firemen, and opposing a minimum wage of $2 a day. This stalwart of the rich was one of the people who, by the way, is first um, made an appeal 
for a, na I'm, uh, we, we learned yesterday, for a national health plan when he became president. He was Teddy Roosevelt. So he runs as mayor against Henry George. The Democrats, he runs as the Republican mayor, as a Republican candidate. The Democrats, who are aligned with Tammany Hall, however, see the United Labor Party as an effort to undermine the support base, the Democratic base, the base that they had always had within the working class. So the Democratic Party and Tammany Hall puts up its, as its own candidate an iron master by the name of Abraham, Abram, I'm sorry, Hewitt, H-E-W-I-T-T, -T, who opposed a third party and opposed George, in his own words, as, quote, trying to organize one class against other classes. So the principal opposition against George was an echo of some of the early anti-communism that we'd seen even in the 70s. It's the notion that to talk about class is un-American. To suggest that there were class divisions in America was fundamentally un-American. And so what you're getting is the Democratic Party appealing to itself as being a, quote, labor party that is pro-American because it represents working men in cooperation with capital, Hewitt being an iron manufacturer, as that, that American progress would come from the unity of labor and capital, not the division between labor and capital. No, no, he opposed the minimum wage. I'm sorry, minimum, opposed the minimum wage of $2. Hewitt wins the election with 90,000 votes. George comes in second with 68,000 votes. Roosevelt third with 60,000 votes. What we seem to understand from having looked at voting districts is that the Republicans in what was known as the Silk Stocking District, we now call that the Upper East Side, voted with Hewitt voted for the Democrat in order to deny George the victory. That's to say the Republicans, realizing that they were going to lose, in fact, vote for the Democrat to make sure that the Labor candidate, that this United Labor Party candidate doesn't win. And Tammany is a consequence, which also does get the votes, by the way, of many of the very poor, because it provides them with jobs, becomes the big winner of this election. The campaign for labor then shifts from a labor party back to the workplace. And after 1899, it focuses in New York City on struggles of garment workers, and particularly Jewish socialists, informed by traditions and allegiances brought from Europe. In 1880, the sewing machine had improved the quality and the output of workers making garments. And there were 23,000 people making garments in the U.S. Two out of every three of these people worked in New York City. New York City becomes the center of the American garment industry. They are mostly working, increasingly now working now, in inside shops or factories that are emerging, employing as many as several hundred workers at once. There are a division between women's work and men's work in men's shops versus women's shops making men's garment and women's garments. And when they unionize, they divide into two different groups. The ILGWU, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, the ILGWU represents the women. The Amalgamated Clothing Workers represents the men. The number of shops increases from 966 in 1880 to over 6,000 in 1900. So increasingly we have them not just in large factories, but in small shops everywhere in the city that are competing with large shops. And in these small shops, in order to compete, conditions replicate the worst conditions of what we associate with sweatshop labor. So there were all these grounds for protest. Longer hours, fines, piecework, constant speed ups. Men are being told to make seven or eight cloaks a day instead of five or they'd be replaced. 
Again, a version of the time of, of efficiency demands. Efficiency becomes the byword. People are required to buy their own thread. Workshops we know are unsanitary. You're not allowed to leave the room to go to the toilet because you were going to, in fact, break production. Or they thought that you were just being lazy. And doors would be locked to keep people in. So garment workers begin to protest. In 1883, 750 workers in New York, half of them women, strike to restore a peace rate that had fallen 50% over three years. They win it back. But these gains are short-lived and the rates fall again. And they're constantly having to go back out on strike. In 1886, garment workers join the demand for the eight hours in a group called the Jewish Workers Verein. V-E-R-E-I-N, a, a word that's taken from the German and then from the Yiddish, so, which is their own kind of collective, uni a union. Many of them join the Socialist Labor Party after George is defeated. Others form, in 1888, the United Hebrew Trades, a socialist-oriented federation. And in 1900, that organization becomes the ILGWU, this organization of the garment workers, the ladies' garment workers. The next years would see these unions blossom in some major strikes, three of which I want to end with today by noting. The events between 1909 and 1913 speak to the extraordinary moment in New York City's history of class solidarity and cross-class alliances at the same time in which elements of the wealthy come to understand that these conditions had become so abhorrent that they had to stand shoulder to shoulder with some of the working men. But in standing shoulder to shoulder, that did not mean that they always articulated the same concerns. So we end up with class and cross-class alliances that are, that in, that in unifying together, we're going to shape the kinds of responses to these terrible conditions. The Cross-Class Alliance was a group called the Women's Trade Unity League, Women's Trade Unity League an alliance of immigrant and Jewish, Jewish garment workers, famous names in American women's history of Clara Lemlich, Franny Cohn, Pauline Newman, Rosa Schneiderman, all books you'll be reading when you read, look at Kathy Pice's work and others. And they join with elite women like Mary Dreyer, Anna, listen to this name, Pierpont Morgan, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. So you can hear in those names that we have the daughters and wives of the very wealthiest, not all the wealthiest, the others were sometimes the employers of these companies, standing shoulder to shoulder and saying these conditions are abhorrent we stand in support of these garment workers. In 1909 and 1910, a strike against three shirt waist factories, a strike to create a union shop to demand that they be allowed to unionize, leads to the up, what's called the uprising of 20,000, a strike of 20,000. The three shops that refused to unionize have the name Leisermans, Leisersons, the second was Rosen Brothers, and the third is the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. It became a general strike in which some 30,000 female workers went out that winter. The shirtwaist, by the way, is a kind of stylish women's blouse. That's what they're making. Worn often with an ankle length skirt. They demand a 20% pay rise, a 52-hour work week, extra pay for overtime, and ultimately they win many of those things. Unfortunately, fiercely anti-union owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire meet with the 20 largest factories to form a manufacturing association to resist the unions. And police officers are brought in on behalf of the factory owners to start arresting strikers. The judges line up on behalf of the manufacturers and arrest the strikers and start fining them and sentencing them to labor camps. One judge, while sentencing a picketer for, quote, incitement, explained, quote, 
You are striking against God in nature, whose law is that man shall earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. You are on strike against God. So those are the kinds of attitudes they were dealing with. The strike ends in February of 1910 with winning higher wages and shorter hours with several, in several of the factories. One factory refuses to unionize. In particular, it was Triangle. And that leads us to event two and the reason for putting this lecture today. Tomorrow is the 99th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire around the corner. March 25th, 1911. A fire breaks out on the top floor of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. The bosses on the 10th floor escape down a fire escape and the roof. Firefighters arrive at the scene, but their ladders only reach the 6th floor. The trapped women inside, because the owners had locked them in, locked the fire doors to escape the exit doors, the workers either suffocate or they jump to their deaths. In 18 minutes, the fire was open, over, and 146 of the 500 workers, mostly young women, were dead, many of their bodies lying on the floor. Such an event of bodies leaping from a tall building to their death would not be seen again until 9-11. Many New Yorkers not realizing how an earlier generation had seen a similar event. It was, if those of you who saw those images can imagine the horror from people on the streets seeing that of young women then. In the aftermath, Anna Morgan, Alva Belmont, hosted a meeting at the Metropolitan Opera House to demand action on fire safety. This is where these upper class elite women in the trade, Women's Trade Union League stand shoulder to shoulder with the working class women. A few days later, more than 350,000 people participate in a funeral march for the Triangle dead. The fire and the protests profoundly influenced a couple of young people who witnessed it. One was a man by the name of Robert Wagner. The second was Frances Perkins. She would become the first cabinet member in the New Deal. He, of course, would author pioneering labor legislation in the New Deal. And he would chair a factory investigation committee that would be formed that would lead to the state accepting that it would have a role in fire safety, sanitation, and protective legislation for women and children. And what we get, in other words, out of this in New York is a kind of dress rehearsal, a term I've used in a paper here, for the New Deal. New York City, in seeing the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, begins to imagine new senses of rights for workers. And those workers, however, it should be seen at the same time as they accept a new role for the state, accept them within gendered and class terms. It presumes that these will be legislation for women and children, but not for men. The men, by the way, accept that because they're happy to get their wives and daughters back home where they should do the cooking and raising babies. And it empowers legislation for fire safety. Though as much liberalism did at the time, it didn't provide any money for fire safety inspectors. It just passed the legislation. So we know that, in fact, fire codes are, never, are not particularly enforced. So it also becomes a marker of the ways in which the state gets involved in all of its ironic implications, pro and con at that moment. There was one last event I was going to mention briefly, and that's 1913 at Madison Square Garden. It's known as the Patterson Pageant. It's on Madison Square, June 7th. And it comes after a bitter strike by a radical group that exists in New York and America at exactly this time called the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. And one we needs to know that however much the ILGWU and these socialist unions made people anxious. There were much more radical unions active in Greenwich Village and in New York that were leading the campaign, not just for higher wages, but for the abolition of the wage system entirely. They were arguing not just to create a union, but to create one big union and to have general strikes 
arguing that there was class struggle that workers should take over forever. Some of you have seen stories of some of these people. John Reed in films like, uh, what was the name of the film? Uh, Reds, that's the name of the film you would, you, you would know. That Patterson pageant is held because of a major strike in Patterson and these middle class and elite people decide to hold a fundraising rally to replicate the strike at Madison Square Garden. So what do we have in the uprising? We have the f uprising, the fair and pageant. What do we see? One is that by the 18 teens, New York City is a labor town with crucial support from a liberal reform elites, a fraction of the elite society who see it as a serious alternative to more radical groups that are also in Greenwich Village and are outspoken, that we'll, some of whom we'll talk about when we talk about the emergence of Greenwich Village as a site for Bohemian New York. And finally, as one historian has noted, the protocols, the Factory Investigation Committee we see in New York, the emergence really of the backdrop to what will become New Deal state policy, all of which is authored out of the New York City experience, in which it accepts the role of the state to regulate the excesses of capital and give labor fair treatment. It presumes not that capitalism is bad, but that bad capitalists should be controlled. The problem is not capitalism, it's bad capitalists. It's the people who run the sugar race triangle fire, who, by the way, just as you should know, are exonerated from the fire. Because, again, the judges and the courts are on their side. Finally, Perkins and Wagner would model labor protective legislation on what they learned gender, race, and class composition of labor. There would be no blacks. Protective legislation would ignore men. It would get women out of factories. And it offers an alternative to class struggle in the allegiance, I would argue, of benevolent matriarchs to demonstrate that the problem was not capitalism, but a few bad capitalists. See you next time. <laughs>